Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at a Daystar Quark Chromosphere. It's an H-alpha solar filter designed for looking at the sun. So you've seen other solar telescope reviews here before from Lunt and Coronado. This is the third of the major manufacturers who do this kind of work. So again, we should get the standard warnings out of the way. Please do not look at the sun unless you are absolutely sure you know what you're doing. If you know what you're doing, you have a tendency to know that you know what you're doing. If there is any doubt in your mind whatsoever, please do not look at the sun. Get with somebody who's done this before. We want everybody to be safe here. So if you do want to look at the sun, there's, you know, a couple of ways that you can do this. The easiest and cheapest way is to get a so-called white light broadband filter. And I've got a couple of these here. These things cost about $100 or so, and they go on in the front of your telescope. And I've got a couple of these. Some of these are film and some of these are glass. And I recommend that you do this because it's kind of interesting to look at the sunspots through your telescope. But if you want to get better, get a better view, you need an H-alpha filter. Now, a broadband filter brings all of the wavelengths of light down, you know, about the same amount. But a narrow band filter like this one just gives you that narrow, the narrowest of bands to let you see exactly what you're looking at on the sun and rejects all of the other stuff which can mess up the image. So the difference is not subtle. You can have the white light filter here, which is interesting, but I find it usually is kind of boring after about 10 minutes or so. But the H alpha viewing is, of course, much different. So much so that in my mind, I classify these two activities as completely different aspects of amateur astronomy. So if you've seen the Lunt and Coronado reviews, this is the Quark Daystar, and this, they do things a little bit differently. There are two major differences as opposed to the Lunt and Coronados that you've seen before. First of all, if you've seen those other reviews, there is a tuning etalon. It's sort of a mechanical thing that tunes for either the surface detail or the prominences because the tuning is slightly different. You don't really get both at once. You sort of go back and forth for one or the other. Now, what Daystar does is they don't have the tuning mechanism. They just sell you two different models. The chromosphere, which is this one that does the surface detail, and the prominence model, which just does the prominences of the stuff on the outside. They don't bother so much with the tuning. The second thing that they do differently is that the Lunt and the Coronado are complete plug-and-play units. You just put the thing on your mount and off you go. The Daystar Cork is a filter alone and everything else is on you. So for example, put this aside here. If we have a Teleview 85, like this, take this like this, and in this goes, and off you go. By the way, this Teleview 85 and this cork, it's a combination that works really well together. You know, as often as I've played with this thing recently, I still can't get over how tiny this unit is. I mean, this is the whole thing. The box itself is not very large. It's got the instruction manual and some other stuff in it, but that's the whole thing, folks. And this is the end that goes into the telescope, and this looks suspiciously like the bottom end of a hybrid Nagler eyepiece. This is the H-alpha unit itself. It's, again, very tiny, and this is where you put your eyepiece. So I've had people notice that uh, this actually looks like one of those ASI cameras. And in fact, if, depending on how you measure it, it it's actually about at the same size as this ASI 224MC that I've been using to take solar images with it. So all of the magic happens inside this device. So one other quirk of this device, other than the fact that you have to supply your own telescope and that there are two models, is this model actually does require power. You see I've got this plugged into a micro USB cable here and it needs to warm up. So you see the, the pilot light here is orange or amber. The instructions say that it takes about five to 10 minutes for this to turn green. Now, in my experience, I've been using this, it takes a little bit longer than that. It takes probably 12 to 15 minutes and it's, you know, 50 degrees or so outside. Okay, so it says that you're supposed to use this device in 80 millimeter uh, telescopes or smaller, F4 to F9 refractors, 
if you are using this on a telescope that is 120 millimeters in diameter in aperture or above, what you're supposed to do is screw in this IR filter. And there are some other minor caveats as well. This has to be the first thing that the light hits. And on the other end, this is where the eyepiece goes. The manual says to use teleview eyepieces of 25, 32, or 40 millimeter length plossils. Let's go ahead and comply with that. This is a 30 millimeter plossil. And put that in like this, and there you go. It's ready to be put into a telescope for solar observing. Okay, so it's been about 11 and a half minutes, and you'll see that the light has turned green. Now there's one additional adjustment in here. There's this dial, and you can't see this, but there are click stops in between. And this is to fine tune the view, and it's said to move the tuning by about a tenth of an angstrom or so. So I did want to point this out. The light is green, but if you do change the tuning at all, the light goes back to orange or amber for a short time. Now it's not gonna take the full five to 10 minutes to come back, it usually comes back pretty quickly. One question I've had, can you look through the device if the pilot light is amber? And the answer is yes, you can. Uh, it's no big deal, you can look through it even before the unit warms up. I do it all the time. One other thing to point out, there is a integrated 4.3X Barlow inside this device. It's in here somewhere. So whatever telescope you put it in, the view is going to be a lot larger and the field of view is going to be a lot smaller than you might be expecting given the native focal length of your telescope. Okay, so we've got this thing all set up. This thing's going to turn green in just a moment. Let's go outside, put this in a telescope, and go observing. So here we have a complete working rig. This is the Astrotech AT72. I also used it in the Teleview 85 and in the Astrophysics Stowaway. I'm choosing the AT72 right now because it has the shortest focal length. It should be the easiest to find the sun. Now you may not be able to see it, but there is a power tank at the bottom here powering the mount. And again, you do have to power the cork unit itself. So I have one of these big power bricks here supplying power to it. They do warn you that the device takes about 1.5 amps worth of power. So if you have something really small, like a laptop or one of those little mini batteries, may not be enough juice to power the battery. Now again, what draws a lot of people to this device is you can bring your own telescope to the party. You're not locked into whatever Lunt or Coronado give you. That's good in some ways, and in some ways it can cause some frustrations. For example, everything else is on you. The finder is on you. I would take all finders off my telescope. I wouldn't cap them. There's nothing here at all. Some people fashion their own finder using a drinking straw and something like a piece of cellophane tape at the end, something that you can project something on so that you can find the sun. But again, I'll point out that this does have a 4.3 Barlow in it, so the sun is going to be a lot bigger than you expect, and the field of view is going to be a lot smaller, so it may take you a while to find the sun. I pointed this out before, and people say, how can you not find the sun? It's the most obvious thing up in the sky. But trust me, the first time you do this, especially with the Barlow in here, you're going to have a little bit of trouble. And in fact, it took me, you know, about one or two sessions before I was able to reliably find the sun through this telescope. Another thing you want to try to do is get a glare shield like this. I've got a piece of cardboard on here with a hole cut in it. I've got lots of these now for all the solar scopes that I've used. Another thing you want to get is something to shroud over your head. I just put a blanket over myself and look, but I've seen some people, some of you I know, build some very serious contraptions that you can put over the whole thing. Some of them look like ice fishing huts or little houses that you put over, but you don't have to do that. I just get a blanket and put it over my head. Now the normal way to find the sun is to remove this glare shield and then turn your back to the sun and minimize the shadow of the telescope on the ground. That should get you close and then you can pan around. Now I do want to point out again, all of this is on you if you supply your own telescope. For example, you want to be very careful not to let unfiltered light through. That may sound silly, but it is easy to do if you're not paying attention. For example, if you're changing from a diagonal to straight through viewing, you're going to be taking the device off. You want to be sure to cap the telescope itself before you do that, otherwise unfiltered light can come through. This is the reason I'm not 
terribly fond of Herschel wedges. Yes, they're safe if you use them correctly, but it could create a condition that is an unsafe condition, just like this. Again, whenever ever I'm moving anything on this thing, I will stop and think before taking anything on or off. Getting started here or coming from the Lunt Coronado world, which I did, it can take you a couple of sessions before you get this down. And in fact, it took me about three full sessions before I got completely comfortable with this rig, looking at the sun, finding it, and finding focus, and so forth. All right, after you do that, how are the views? I have to say, they're pretty darn good. So the chromosphere model actually will show you some prominences. It's just optimized for the, the surface detail and not for the prominences themselves. I'm also noticing from people who have both units, they'll tell me that the chromosphere is better at looking at the prominences than the prominence model is at looking at the surface detail. So for that reason, many people do get the chromosphere model first. And it is fascinating to watch. I'm panning around and looking at the sun and it is fantastic. Now, if you want, you can try imaging with this. I will usually switch from the diagonal to a straight through mode. Again, if you're taking this off, be sure to cap the telescope before you change. Otherwise, unfiltered light will be coming through the telescope. Now, I'm using the ASI 224 MC. And again, this took a while before I was able to find the right amount of extension tubes and the right focus and the right settings and sharp cap and so forth. I also want to point out my skills as a solar imager are modest. I find that solar imaging is an art form in itself. Some of you I know are very good at this. So with that in mind, take a look at some of these images that I've done. And I mean, I don't know about you, I find some of this stuff really fascinating to look at. All right, so as you can see, it's a bright sunny day. I'm gonna spend some time looking at the sun. Okay, so which one of the three systems should you buy? Should you get a Lunt, a Coronado, or a Daystar? And I think it's going to come down to two things having to do with you. So first of all, I think the performance of all three systems are all very, very good. Now, I know that the manufacturers will say, well, ours is better because of this, and we do this a little bit differently. And for all I know, all of those things are true. I'm telling you, in most practical uses, the performance are all of all three of these are quite good and I don't really see all that much difference. Your preference is going to come down to two things. Number one, do you like plug and play or do you want to tinker? If you like to plug and play, you don't want to mess with anything, get the Lunt or the Coronado, everything's a complete package. If you're the type that likes to BYO telescope and you like to experiment and tinker with things, the Quark might be for you. I will point out, however, that according to Daystar's instructions, they really do want to see you put this in a refractor from F4 to F9. So your degrees of freedom as to what you put this in aren't quite as wide as you might think when you first come to the device. The second factor is this internal 4.3x Barlow. This will bring you closer to the sun, the magnification will be higher, the field of view will be lower. You may like that, you may not care for that so much. So that's your personal preference. I'll say for me, I had a ball with this device. I mean, every clear morning, every clear afternoon, I was out looking at the sun, taking images. And I'll say for me, taking images through this thing was easier than the other two devices, at least the way that I do it. So there you have it, a look at the Daystar Quark Chromosphere model, H-alpha solar filter for looking safely at the sun. I hope this review has helped you to decide if this product is right for you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.